No is not enough, says Naomi Klein, so if no isn't sufficient, what might be? This week on The Laura Flanders Show, I talk with Gar Alperovitz, co-chair of the Next System Project, about the pluralist economy that he sees emerging from the gloom of today's crisis. Then, to continue the optimism, a video from Local Futures counts down the many changes that can come from investing your money and your energy locally. All that and a few words from me on the diggers and feeding while remaking the world. It's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. So there are times for ideas, as well as action, but ideas that can foment a future plan for action, or many plans. Garl Paravitz is the author of a new book called Principles, Principles of a Pluralist Commonwealth. And it's all about surfacing some ideas that could help give us direction as we move forward at a time when forward movement maybe isn't going to be happening as quickly as we might like, at least not from the top. Garl Pervis is no stranger to this program. Glad to have you back. Thanks for oh, coming great, in. Great to be here. Thanks. So talk about why principles of a pluralist commonwealth in these times that seem so authoritarian. Well, the, the argument is that, and I sometimes put it this way, um, major ideas about systemic change uh, don't matter most of the time. Power matters. Institutional power, military power but not always. <laughs> and there are times when people actually begin to say there is a systemic challenge and what would be a systemic alternative becomes a meaningful idea for many people. That means it's a time to really talk about in a very, very serious way. If you don't like corporate capitalism, you don't like state socialism, and if you're not satisfied with some of the models that are beginning to be explored, how do we precipitate and, and kind of generate a serious debate about much deeper systemic issues at many different levels? And also connect that with organizing, what's going on on the ground. So this is a, um, I don't think books like this matter mo most of the time, but I think the time when people can actually engage with ver very serious mm -hmm. theoretical problems. So talk about a little bit more about that, because you've been on this path for a long time. We've had this conversation <laughs> about systemic change being important and putting out ideas being important. but. This feels to me as if it is tailored specifically for the post-Trump election moment yep. in some interesting ways. It is indeed, and, and indeed we've made the book available free. It's available online. It's, it's just next system slash principles because uh, we want activists to do it, and there's a big pick, pick up on it already. Uh, there are more and more people who realize, who didn't realize, that we face a genuine systemic problem, that there is ca corporate capitalism is producing semi-fascist models all over the world. And the traditional models available to us, liberalism or social democracy, are decaying before your eyes, uh, primarily because the labor movement's collapsed in virtually all the advanced systems. Here it's down to 6% in the private sector. So that whole model of labor-based social democracy holding the corporations slightly at bay is decaying. We're getting Trump here and we're getting semi-fascist operations beginning at everywhere in Europe. We'll see how far they go. So people realize something much deeper, much deeper than politics, and also closer to us than the theory there'll be a revolution someday in the far future is here. It poses the question, if you really don't like state socialism, you really don't like corporate capitalism, what is it? And there are some, there's a big debate about this in some parts. Some people think worker-owned companies are the answer to the systemic problem. Uh, I favor a lot of worker-owned companies, but that's one piece of the puzzle. Um, one of the questions in this, this particular system, it's a continental system, 3,000 miles across. By design, Madison understood and said explicitly, if we can keep going west and spreading people out, we can divide and conquer the working class. He didn't use that term, but we can keep power at the center. He is much more clear about this. He's a Karl Marx's position. Mm 
that the people with the power, he says that explicitly, people who have the wealth have to keep the people who don't have wealth at bay or they'll take it over. And this is a continent, we're spread out. And they play the game of dividing and conquering by moving jobs around. So if you think about that, a continent of 3,000 miles, you can drop Germany into Montana. Those are little countries. And you can get a polity, a grouping in those countries. Ultimately, one of the questions that has to be faced is regional scale. And I think we're going to see regionalism as a serious, really a serious possibility devolving the system. California, there was a Brexit kind of idea beginning. New England has got a whole series of regional developments. Texas is even more interesting because the right wingers are talking about secession when they get angry. But the demography of that state is really interesting. Over 20 years, it's going to be a very, very progressive state as the Hispanic vote. So one of the questions, and this is only one, is about scale, which is not in our dialogue. We haven't been talking about it as a, as a possibility. But the community as a whole has interests that are different than the workers. So, so for instance, in a market system, and most people are talking about some form of market system, even on the left, worker-owned companies facing each other in a competitive market have to externalize costs. They have to pollute. They have to drive down wages. They are in a situation that the market forces them up against very difficult problems. So that, in small scale, it probably is manageable. Little co-ops, it probably works out. But, you know, another piece of it is equality. The garbage workers have their worker-owned company, and the oil workers have their worker-owned company. That's a, that's a recipe for a power struggle that is totally independent of who owns and controls. But so doesn't the Mondragon model propose some kind of community leg of the stool? Yes, Mondragon does try to open, Mondragon's very interesting in that way. It does open a community, and that's exactly the question. Where does, what is the role of the community in both a culture and power? So at certain scales, I think small-scale worker-owned companies and worker co-ops make a whole lot of sense. But at another scale where power becomes part of the game, how, what do you do it? Mondragon never took pol politics and policy uh, into account. We're talking about the, the big cooperative business in Spain that is often lifted up as the largest to-scale model of, of industrial cooperatives. Yes, and it's a series of, several, I think, many, many, now 80 or so co-ops together integrated in a model. But again, Mondragon also never got more than 4% of the population in that part of the world in their own province. The same is said of Emilia Romagna, which in, in Italy is the other big example. And it's very exciting and very interesting things, but no political spread of any significance beyond very small scale. And it's a real challenge to ask the question why and how. So uh, this book is, is a fairly hard-headed book about where do worker co-ops make sense? Where do community structures, like community utilities, for instance, or community ownership of larger business, or the Cleveland model, which you know about, which is a neighborhood-wide ownership scheme to which worker-owned companies are attached. It's a complex model, but it brings the community as a whole into the driver's seat. If it's a time to really think through what the next system looks like, we're going to get much harder and tougher about how these things actually begin to work out in time. Coworker Corps is just one example of the issues or the, yes. the ideas and questions that you lift up in the book. Name some of the others. I mean, I know you deal with finance, you deal with banking. What yeah. are some of the others? Well, starting with worker and community. Community is the center of the argument that unless you rebuild a culture of community, which requires economic institutions that nurture rather than divide the culture. And media institutions. And media institutions. We're counting on you for <laughs> developing that for us, Laura. Working on it. What, what, if we don't start with community, you can't build from A to B to C to D. So community design is very important. But obviously, finance is part of that. And you know, one of the things we're seeing all over the country, all these things are beginning to develop. There are, there are the structures of ownership and control in Cleveland, but now in Rochester, and maybe also in Jackson, Mississippi complex community slash worker co-ops, but not just freestanding. But banks are another piece. There are public banks, which six years ago, I think when we first met, or seven or eight years yeah. ago at the first banking conference, it was a kind of an eye, my goodness, maybe someday. The Philadelphia's got it on the agenda. Uh, Santa Fe's got it. Los Angeles, Oakland, Washington, D.C. So there's a big expansion now of an idea which seemed extremely impossible of cities and communities owning public banks and then using that resource to finance
worker-owned co-ops, complex development projects, et cetera, et cetera. And something similar going on around energy. Energy is the same thing. And so we're seeing all the pieces of the puzzle, many of them at one level, community or co-op, at another level, we're getting to city or larger community. We're seeing neighborhood development as in Cleveland, which is in large cities, a neighborhood of 20,000 people is a big piece of the action. So it, it's a complex, we're seeing a complex plural form of development. How might we create a system that instead produces sustainability, democracy, peace? Fundamentally, it means changing who owns the country. If we can democratize wealth in a society where the richest 20 Americans alone control more wealth than the bottom half combined, we can democratize political power. One design for a next system, what I call the pluralist commonwealth, helps clarify what we want and how we get there. It takes a plural approach to building different forms of commonwealth. Taken together, such forms create a practical and decentralized mosaic of a democratic economy to transform and displace the predatory, extractive elements of the current system. The story, the history story that you tell, though, that I really want to make sure you, you, you tell to our audience is the parallel that you see between the, the agriculture-based populist movements of the late 19th century and this upsurge of conversation and interest and activism that hasn't been naming itself as a movement yet, but, but maybe is. In my view, we are the most interesting period. Let me say this carefully as a historian. <laughs> I think this is the most interesting period of American history, bar none, including the American Revolution. I think it's a big deal. I think they have run out, corporate capitalism has run out the options that can sustain its legitimacy. All too briefly, in the 19th century, every time they got in trouble, they moved west, took more land, expanded, moved the problem out. In the 20th century, by chance, not by design, in the first quarter of the century, the system was in great trouble, and World War I bailed us out. Now, they didn't do that for that reason. Same thing in the, in the, in the middle part of the century, the second quarter. The Great Depression was floundering at the end of the 1930s. World War II bailed it out. Then Korea, Vietnam, and the big Cold War, third quarter of the century. The, in, during the Korean War, we were at 14% of the GDP in military spending. This economy now has only 3.3% of the economy for military, and it's huge, but not enough to manage the system. So it's kind of been on life support. It's in decay. They, they, they can't manage the system properly, and <laughs> they're running out of big wars, which they can't do because of nuclear weapons. So I think the system will continue to stagnate. There, there will be violence. There will be upsurge and a sense of building that something's really wrong here, because I think they've run out of the capacity to actually manage it in a way that keeps it legitimate. So I think this period, uh, this period is the opening phase. Uh, you know, I'm a historian and, and, as well as a political economist. This is a period where the big deal is, I think, on the table of opening the large, large questions of capitalism without the usual capacity to resolve them available. So time for organizing, time to rethink the old models, and that's exciting. A lot of people are rethinking, we don't like state socialism and what is the alternative model, which is what this is. Is it this swirl of activity around new economy that creates the new political frontier, as it were? I think what creates the frontier is the pain levels at almost every level. And I think what the new economy movement, which we've talked about many times and we were both involved in, is beginning to look for ways in different parts of it to build up new alternatives at every different level. Black Lives Matter is looking at these things. What's going on in Jackson, Mississippi could be very interesting. But also there's, there are Hispanic developments that are people haven't quite caught on in, in Albuquerque and in Los Angeles. There, there are many many, many in interesting experiments in the white community, but not enough. But what about the politics of it? Well, the politics of it is partly now reactive, I think. Angry, re res resisting, and that's very necessary. And beginning, as in Black Lives to put out platforms. I think the next phase is actually getting serious about, if you don't like corporate capitalism and you don't like state socialism, what is it that you want? And let's go beyond slogans and really have a serious, as I say, ideas matter sometime. Let's have a real discussion of what makes sense and how we build on the pieces of the puzzle that are beginning to develop all over the country, laying groundwork. You know, my heroes are the, the civil, civil rights activists in Mississippi in the 1930s. They were the people who laid down the groundwork for what, you know, it's easy to join a movement when the movement's moving. 
it's very hard to do it at the early stages when you're developing the preconditions of the movement. And I think that's where we are. I think it's a very, very important period of history. Looking internationally, just for a minute before we close, there have been some interesting experiments or experiences in other parts of the world. I'd love to get your take on what happened in Greece with uh, the Syriza movement that took power on a platform of some of this solidarity economics and with the support of some of the people that have been engaged in that. And then once they got into power, eventually had to concede to outside pressure. Um, Spain, Barcelona, yep. uh, a movement, a mayor, uh, whose roots are in a people's movement around housing that's also got a commitment to the commons and the digital commons, and we've spoken to some of those people on this um, show. Uh, Germany, same thing, around yep. municipal power in terms of housing and energy. I'm going to look more into that this summer. Um, what are you drawing in the way of lessons, uh, salutary and otherwise? Uh, no, the very interesting things, I think particularly Spain, where the municipalities, mun municipal government can be really important in all this because it can help set the conditions. Even in Argentina, very few people, th we should mention that as well, the worker-owned companies, many of them had contracts with the municipal government. That's how they were sustained. That's a mini socialist model, a socialist government, a municipality, helping support worker that's a complex of the kind I was talking about, same in Spain. The larger question, which is posed by Greece, and this is really, I think, the hardest place in the argument that most people have not yet confronted, Greece was up against the central monetary policy, and the Germans crashed them and said, no, no play. The answer to that is semi-independence, breaking away. That means in the United States, and this is very hard, how would you get beyond the dollar monetary, uh, the whole continent. And I suspect ultimately regions are going to have to take that on. And you think of California, the sixth largest economy in the world, controlled by Wall Street and controlled by the Federal Reserve Board in terms of its monetary policy. At some point, the light bulb, there was a, Brex there was a Brexit movement started in California. At some point, throw two, de two decades on the table, the independence of regions becomes a monetary question as well, which is where the Greeks got killed because they've stayed with the euro. So I think we're going to see all those big questions opening up. We're at the early stages. But the starting point is there is no available solution other than fascism, which we may see. And then the question becomes, when that's over and knocked down, as in Chile, What's your next move? What is it that you want and why? We may have to go through severe repression with these guys. Um, so that's an option to put on the table. Even so, the world does not end. Well, let's hope it doesn't happen. But what is your vision and how do you build beyond? And what makes sense? This book is an attempt to say, you know, what really makes sense? What, why should we do X, Y, or Z? And push the argument a little bit further than I'm pushing myself, let me say. Let me just push you a little bit on this question of local and secession and withdrawal. Because we saw what happened with the UK and Brexit. We see some of the nativist, white nationalist tendencies inside the Trump administration. The appeal there could exploit some of the gr same grievances you're talking about and direct them in a very fascist direction. They are doing that. When I think about your 1930s civil rights heroes, they came from a movement informed by a notion of internationalism and globalism. Um, can't we revive that as a part of this oh, picture? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. The question becomes in a continental system, and the European systems are not continental. I mean, as I say, you can drop Germany into Montana. They're little countries compared with this vast, how do you organize a polity that can build a common consciousness and a sense of collective future? But that consciousness needs to be internationalized, course, doesn't it? Of course it does. But you start with where, where you are. How do you build that up? How do you actually generate it? Uh, you know, for my sins, many years ago, I worked in the government, in House and Senate, and for a while working on UN matters in the State Department. And what uh, people had great ideas, but every time they did something, the corporations would destroy it on the ground. So you've got to change the base, or you don't have a, you do not have an internationalist policy unless you change the institutional structure. So how do you get to the internationalism without falling into the gulf of white nationalism? The only way, you know, is, is my civil rights friends, start at the bottom and build up both consciousness and institutions that begin to change who we are as a nation and who we are as a polity.
I think you start with system change and you start at the lowest level. You start with co-ops and worker owned co complexes and utilities and regional and state and then to regions, building up the sense that we're all in it together. And that particularly the ownership of capital and how do we do that in an egalitarian and equitable way. But unless we begin that way and actually see it, I think the, you know, I write about nuclear weapons and the way we've used them. Yeah. Unless we do that and change the whole culture from the bottom up, we don't get there. So um, I don't see a shortcut. I mean, we can do, I think consciousness is raising in many parts of the country, but I don't see a shortcut unless we change actually the practices and the institutions that generate the kinds of consciousness that lead to Trump on the one hand and violence on the other and nuclear weapons beyond. And your vision of the Commonwealth? Because these are principles for a pluralist Commonwealth. Yes, the Commonwealth begins with who owns capital in common as communities, as co-ops, as regions, as states, and in a way that doesn't produce statism, state socialism, but also avoids some of the pitfalls of some of the kind of easier ways of doing it. And then we get workers fighting with workers, black and white. We've done, we've done very little, all of us, to deal with white working class difficulties. And that's a central problem the movement has got to face. We've been avoiding that. We haven't found a way to do much, few places. And I think that's on the agenda for if we get beyond the fights between, they'll exploit the race, white, black, and brown. They're going to continue to exploit it unless we're serious about it. There are great models of that sort of work happening all over the country. Yeah. You have great models in your book of the kind of uh, bottom-up initiatives that yeah. people ask about all the time. I want to thank you so much for being such a key part of this program. Oh, thank you. Thanks for all the work you do. It's wonderful. You can find out more about the pluralist principles or the principles for a pluralist commonwealth at our website by Garl Parowitz. Up next, a short video created by Local Futures, one of the leading organizations behind the new economy movement. Take a look. It's all about what it means to go local. What do we all care about, really care about? We all want time for friends and family, a world in which everyone has enough to eat and a roof over their head, clean air, clean water, a stable climate. That's what we want. But what are we actually getting? The fact is, most of the things we truly care about are further away than ever. So what's gone wrong? In a word, the economy. More specifically, the global economy. In the global economy, our taxes subsidize corporate giants while killing off local businesses. There's more CO2, fewer jobs, and less democracy. All of this works for multinational banks and corporations, but it doesn't work for people and the planet. Time for a deep breath. Time to clear our heads of all the mumbo-jumbo of economists, politicians, and other so-called experts. Time to think an unthinkably simple thought. If the problem is globalization, how about heading in exactly the opposite direction and supporting local communities and economies instead? Whichever way you look at it, localization is a winner. It reduces inequality, it cuts down pollution, it provides more and better jobs. It connects us with life and with each other. And yes, it even helps to tackle climate change. Better still, it's already happening. So what can we do to help things along? First, join the movement to say no to the trade treaties that hand over ever more power to global banks and corporations. Second, put pressure on policymakers to level the economic playing field by insisting that the taxes, subsidies and regulations that currently favor the big and global are shifted instead towards the smaller and the local. Third, join with community groups that are rebuilding the economy from the ground up. Going local for a world in need of change. When you think of the Protestants, anarchist politics might not immediately spring to mind, but for the 17th century diggers, direct action was a divine mandate. 
planting vegetables on public land as food prices were surging. They sought to create a new sort of economy, one that advanced collaboration and equity in a fundamental sense. Their calls for land redistribution quickly irked local landowners who called an army to intervene. The anti-gentrification movement of their time, the diggers suffered beatings, attacks from local gangs, and arson attempts, all at the behest of the lords and landowners who were right then busily enclosing and privatizing public land. As these relentless attacks carried on, the diggers split off and were ultimately evicted, but their legacy continues. Fast forward three centuries to the 1960s, and the diggers in San Francisco were distributing free food to people who needed it. As Danny Goldberg reminds us in his book, In Search of the Lost Cord, the diggers of San Fran participated in the beans that took place there 50 years ago this summer. Inspired by the 17th century radical Brits, they didn't believe in money or commercialism, and they also provided free legal aid and a free health care clinic that's still around today. The same period saw the Black Panthers run free breakfast, health, and dental clinics, an integral part of their plan to meet people's needs while changing the world. Which all leads me back to new economics. For the first diggers, it was a spade. For the second, a spoon. What's our new politics serving up for the people who need it today? Write to me. Tell me what you think. That's Laura, L-A-U-R-A, at lauraflanders.com. And check out all our archives at lauraflanders.com. I'll be back next week. Mm -hmm.